before we start this morning, I, I have just one thing to say. This is addressed especially to the court next door, that's GC, the overflow. Something disturbing has come to my attention. I believe the people in GC are unruly. They climb on top of the benches, they cheer, they boo, they do what they like. I just want to remind them, GC is an extension of this court. You behave as well as the people in this court. What rules go for this court go also for, the G, for GC. The security who are looking after people in GC, please do your work. I don't want to have to hear this again. It is not an entertainment place. It is not a picnic a, a, a picnic nest. Stop drinking whatever you're drinking or eating whatever you're eating. Please restrain yourself. This is a court. In every court there are rules. Please just make sure that you, if, if, if you, 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 if you do not want to adhere to the rules, you are free to leave and security will make sure that you leave. Thank you. As a court pleases. As the court please, Mr. Minister. You're still under oath, Mr. Dixon? Yes, my lady. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Mayor. May it please the court, my lady. Mr. Dixon, I'm going to start with the demonstration of the bat and, and the gunshots. A couple of questions about that. You listened to the recording of the bat strikes that you made, am I right? That is right, my lady. And you also had the occasion to listen to the gunshots or gunshot that was fired on the first night and that was recorded. That is so, my lady. Is there, could you pick up a difference between the background sound of the two noises? Uh, my lady, to the best of my recollection, the background sound is the same because it, there were um, frogs, it was quite quiet and there were frogs at the night. Um, no. I didn't notice any other difference. On the very short clips, uh, the recording the sound, um, I'm not sure whether all that. In the longer clips where there was a sound playing out, I heard frogs. Yeah. The, you, were you involved in the recording of, my, of this exercise or not? My lady, I was not involved in the recording. My uh, participation was to wield the bat in order to produce some sound which could be recorded. Now, if, if I put to you that, and I'm putting it just as, as I do now, I listen to the sounds, and on listening to it, I formed that idea that the bad sounds were amplified. Do you, can you comment on that? If one listens to the background noise. Um, my lady, uh, what I know about the way the recording was done, the gunshots are of a much higher cracking sound. The bat is, is lower, um, doesn't travel. The idea was to record the sound. Um, if the sound engineer boosted something on his system, to ensure a clean recording, that is the, what a sound engineer, I would assume, does. But I don't know to what degree it would have been. No, no, that's how I understood your evidence yesterday. I'm not saying that you're involved. Just um, testing it again. Um, now, you've indicated yesterday who were all present um, during the first demonstration. Who worked with the sound engineer of the people that were present there? Uh, my lady, um, on the 
20th of March when I was present with the sound. Um, the sound engineer had an assistant and they, from what I could see, because I sat at the, uh, stood at the door, I wasn't at the table at 60 meters and 180 meters where they set up their equipment. So to the best of my knowledge, it was those two people who produced the recordings and then played them back to us when we had finished with our tests. Uh, did you not yesterday say that Mr. Vormerans worked with him? He was at the stages listening, my lady. No, what do you mean? You said he was at, he was listening, was he mm. sitting with them? He was sitting with them, my lady. And listening, <coughs> were they playing it back uh, whilst you were busy? I don't know about that, my lady. I was standing at the door. I, I have no knowledge of the exact sequence of events, what happened at each recording stage. We've dealt with, with um, the fact that you also, now before we go there, could you please indicate to the court how many times and when you went back to the scene. The scene is now the, the crime scene at Silverwoods. Uh, my lady, in preparation for that question, I went to my records. I was at Silverwoods on the 22nd of February. I was there on the 25th of February. I was there on the 1st. Uh, hold on. Th this is last year. You're talking last about year. February last year. My apologies, my lady. Last year on the 22nd of February, the 25th of February, the 1st of March, the 27th of September, 8th of November, <coughs> on the 25th of March. Of which year? This year, my lady. It's in chronological order. And then on the 14th of April, my lady. Um, so you check this and you got this from your records? From my dates. records, yes, my lady. I keep a logbook of my travels. Okay. And talking about records, do you, do you keep a case file system as well? With cases that you work on as an expert? Uh, my lady... Um, since I left the Forensic Science Laboratory of the South African Police, this was the very first case I'd been approached. I do, did not advertise. I was <coughs> not uh, busy looking for external work other than my new employers. I was approached for this job. I keep record of what I do in photographs in a computer in folders. Um. Aren't you mistaken, were you there on the 25th of March and the 26th of March? On the 26th of March, my lady, I was at the um, that was the kiln, I was in Kilna Park shooting range. My memory serves me. I only went to the Delma shooting range once in the 20th. I'm not March. trying to catch you. Uh, no, no, that's... Because it's my memory. Mm -hmm. I thought you said that you could give evidence that the steps curtains were drawn on the night of the 25th and the 26th. Uh, no, on the on night the, on of the, the 14th on the of 14th. April. On the 14th yes. of April. Those were the two times. Okay. So you were there on the 25th and the 14th. Uh, what was the purpose of your visit on the 25th? On the 25th of March, um, my lady, those were the uh, photographs shown of the, wind, the ba bathroom window with various states of illumination <coughs> looking from the outside. That was the purpose of those tests, my lady. And on the 14th, sir? On the 14th, I went there to see how dark it was in the room again, my lady in the bedroom. It's the 14th of <coughs> April, my lady. 2014. 14, yes. 
Thank you. So on the 25th of March, uh, who accompanied you? Uh, on the 25th of March, that was Mr. Volmerans and Mr. van der Westhuizen. The photographs taken, who took them? I took the photographs, my lady. Using your own camera? Using my own camera. And when you went back there on the 14th, who accompanied you? Uh, Mr. Volmerans, my lady. Did you do any tests on the, on the 14th? Um, by tests, yes. We switched the lights on and off, drew the curtains, and looked at the room in various levels of illumination, my lady. You didn't do any uh, light tests, uh, lux meter, or anything like that? My lady, as I stated yesterday, the aim of the test was to see what was visible using one's eyes. A, a instrument which measures a level of light, it's sometimes very difficult to equate that what, what an individual will see or the take into consideration light sources from all around. It's a point, uh, often a point measurement rather than a, the overall ambient light measurement. Now, but as a scientist, I'm sure you would agree that what one can see using your eyes is a very subjective thing. Uh, it depends on each person, my lady, and the state of their eyes and their uh, ability to perceive light. It also depends on whether they're accustomed to being in the dark or being in the bright, changing over. Um, I wanted to see what I could see. A measurement doesn't translate to me into what I'm actually seeing. <laughs> now, as far as a reconstruction of the scene is concerned, with a door at the scene, with this particular door, how many of those reconstructions did you do? Uh, one, my lady. On the other days that you went there, were there any tests done using equipment at, at the house by yourself? Uh, no, my lady, as I stated, I assisted Mr. Vor Morans with measurements uh, while he was doing his uh, laser and probing his ballistic tests. I took measurements on the door um, that's about the only tests, if a measurement can be called a test. Um, a test is actually something that you do to find out something. That's why it's called testing. I took measurements. I didn't do any tests except on the... It was... I think it was the 1st of March... Um, in 2013, I did the test using a, X -ray, a portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, as I stated previously, to determine the composition of the metal smear on the ricochet mark E. Now, on the 14th, your visit on the 14th to the house... Did you draft a report? No, my lady. Did you take any photographs there? No, my lady. Did Mr. Vormanant draft a report? Uh, my lady, I was requested to see. Mr. Vormanant accompanied me. If he did draw up a report, I don't know. But the request went to you. You were the, the person. The request came to me. I gave verbal feedback, my lady, to counsel. Um, now, the, on the day of the reconstruction of the scene at the house, you were there with um, the police team is also there, forensic team. 
Um, uh, on the 8th of November, my lady, there were two policemen there and um, Captain von Art and Mr. Wormerans and myself. What happened on that day? Um, the two members of the SAPS installed the door and then Mr. Wormerans and myself are. Ah, yes. Um, Ms. Adams and Mr. Kruger, if I remember, were also there. Um, we took measurements with the laser. I measured the door, the heights, all around. We took measurements of all sorts of things. Um, Mr. Vormerans probed, and then in the toilet, with the assistance of Ms. Adams, um, we and the probes and the light, we tried to recreate the position for each wound with the trajectory of the bu uh, bullets, my lady. So for each uh, um, bullet path, we tried to see how can we account for the position of the wound and the position of the person in relation to the toilet, my lady. Have you seen a report about that reconstruction? Uh, my lady, the draft report that I mentioned yesterday by Mr. Volmerans contains some of the information that we uh, recorded on that day. Okay, then, then I must go back. I thought the draft report referred to the first reconstruction yesterday. Was I mistaken? Um, my lady, the majority of that draft report drawn up by Mr. Mormorans was, um, from what I could see, a combination of his examination of the exhibits, bullet exhibits, which we did not do there, um, the measurements of the door, the reconstruction, uh, examination of the uh, autopsy photos and other examinations which he might have done which I'm not aware of. And then I assisted him, he asked me to have a look at the report uh, because my English is a little bit better than his and we went through it and so on. But I never saw the final report, my lady. Now, on the, your, the reconstruction of the 8th of November, so were the photographs taken? Uh, there were photographs taken, my lady. Perhaps a video taken? There was no video taken, my lady. Now, let us just deal with this reconstruction on the 8th of November. When you did the reconstruction on the 8th of November, the conclusion, what conclusion did you reach in terms of bullet hole A? Bullet hole A, my lady, that was the bullet that struck the hip at um, wound 4.5. Uh, B? B, my lady, was the bullet that hit the upper arm. C? C, my lady, was the bullet that may have intersected the web of the finger and hit the wall at position E. And D? And D, my lady, was the bullet hole with the bullet that hit the head. And in your reconstruction, where was the magazine rack? Uh, the magazine <coughs> rack was, I would have to look at the photos to refresh. It was in the toilet, my lady. Was it uh, close to the toilet bowl? It was in different positions because we were doing various measurements and so forth. Now, let me just deal with the headwind. Mm -hmm. The magazine rack, did it play any role as far as the headwind is concerned? Uh, in the reconstruction <coughs> as we did it, my lady, 
memory is a, a fleeting thing. Um, the position when one is seated on the rack, the head would have was too high, even if leaning forward. It's um, to achieve the position with the height of the bullet was difficult. Um, we were looking for if you are shot and you falling, what is the uh, positioning that the body would most likely be in? Um, we couldn't fit that. So when the person was on the floor against the magazine rack, then the head was at approximately the, in that area or slightly below where the bullet would hit. So, um, but sitting on the magazine rack, um, in my opinion, and from what we saw was too high, my lady. Are you saying that if, you, if the deceased was sitting on the floor, bullet old D would have hit her in the head? Is that where it happened? She was sitting on the floor and, and bullet old D hit her in the head? My lady, um, from the reconstruction and the sequence of events, we cannot say that she was sitting on the floor it is most probable that the bullet intersected, the head intersected with the trajectory of the bullet as she was falling down. As she was falling down. As she was falling down. So, I just want to understand, so she's standing up, she's standing when A hit her. She then fell. So that the right arm would be in line with bullet old B, the right That forearm. is so, my lady. As she is dropping, bullet hole B is um, about 10 centimeters more higher than bullet hole A. As she's falling down in the <coughs> same, uh, um, close to the door, the arm comes into the line of the bullet, but and they, then she carries on falling until the head <coughs> is hit. This is a very okay. quick okay. movement. Uh, I see what you're saying. You're saying what you're saying. And, and I have to, unfortunately, put on record what you described. Please help me if I'm wrong. You're saying she's going down from the hip, the hip wound. She's turning, and B hits her in the right shoulder. Her head would then be close to the, the wall in front of her. Towards the wall in, in front of her, am I right? Um, no, my lady. I don't know the degree of turning. If my reconstruction, my interpretation of events is correct, she is standing with her arm towards the door handle. Whether she is coming back from having hand, uh, um, locked the door or going forward, I don't know. Standing like that, most probably leaning slightly forward. Um, the bullet go, first bullet goes into the hip, um, and it goes fairly, there was minimal deflection. According to the ballistic report, it went in, according to Simon, just straight in like that, not deviating. So for that to happen, she was at a slight angle to the door. She wasn't standing facing the door. And then as the impact of the bullet broke the hip, and she lost voluntary control, she's unstable on one leg. She cannot use the right leg to move, so she's collapsing. The second shot as she's going down hits the arm and that because she's unstable, she carries on falling and you fall um, backwards because there, there's wood splinters here but none further and then she just collapses down on the ground. I don't know exactly how I never saw the position against the toilet. What I can read from the pool of blood, which is on the bleeding was from the right side of the body. The body would have been um, slightly towards, uh, if the toilet is there, <coughs> slightly to that side, between the front of the toilet and the back of the wall with the magazine rack behind her. Um, so it's a confined space. Sorry, my lady. No, no. Yeah. There's, there's no long distance to fall. It's sort of 
in place. Now, if, if you're wrong about B, that makes it a bit difficult. Uh, that's my interpretation, my lady. Um, I have no other information that makes a different interpretation more probable for myself. Um, as far as the headwind is concerned, was there anything else that guided you about the position of the head when it was struck? The head wound is on the right hand side of the, the head top and it's almost um, horizontal. It didn't, doesn't appear to me in the photographs that it was at a deep angle in that the head was tilted leaning forward <coughs> but I cannot say at what angle the head was. The, there's a lot of damage to the skull. Um, the deflections, as I say, I'm not a wound ballistics or forensic pathologist expert. I'm just interpreting a sequence of events. There are many, um, each action, there's a lot of variables. It's a human body. It will re the human body will react to individual stimuli, not necessarily exactly the same way each time. So it's a variable. Um, when, when you hear a loud noise, you can jerk. Or if you're a different type of person, you hear it and say, what was that, and you don't move. Um, the hu human beings have different responses depending on people, depending on... Uh, some people, if they get stung by a bee, will look at it and pull it off, and others will <coughs> make a thing, or they'll jump backwards. Uh, that's not, that's an intangible, my lady. And uh, trying to work in a probable sequence of events with these intangibles, that they do not uh, uh, cause sort of obvious conflicts, such as a bullet which suddenly changes direction where with no obvious point of ricochet, things like that. Um, that's what I have to think about when I came up with my reconstruction. Bullet hole B is the highest one. As I stated yesterday, after the first uh, shot is pulled, my experience with uh, handguns is that the gun tends to pull up the first time you shoot. And then you're aware that there's going to be and you can hold it more stably the next time. So in my experience, just shooting a handgun or shooting range, that sort of pattern to me um, is entirely possible. So, so yes, now carry on. So if B, the whole B is the second bullet and the height and after getting hit by the bullet, position by bullet A in the hip and the body becomes immediately unstable and all the energy of that bullet is transferred into the hip. There's instability. The noise, the shock of hitting the body could have caused the person to jerk. That is an involuntary movement by external stimulus or a direct stimulus. And then as you, because your leg is unstable, you cannot hold yourself up, you're in, not in control, your body starts dropping down, the next bullet hits, it also has a high amount of energy. Um, my lady, Mr. Nell, asked me yesterday afternoon. Mr. Um, unfortunately, I've got to stop you, you're not answering a question. I'm trying to answer the question. Which question, my lady, may I just ask this witness which question he's answering at the moment? Which question B. are you answering? The question, my lady, is if B was not the bullet that hit the arm, then my reconstruction has a problem. That's not so. That wasn't the question. You see, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dixon, that's the problem with your evidence. You wanted B 
give the court a version on an aspect where you're not an expert and you're not listening. The question I ask you is, if you take into account the head, did that play any role? What, as far as the position of the head is concerned? My lady, guided you. My lady, the position of the head was the wound was approximately 1.7 meters above the floor. So the deceased was not standing. The position of the point mark E against the wall is approximately 89 centimeters above the floor. So if my um, interpretation sequence of events is correct, she had fallen down and the head was, was falling and the head was in the trajectory of the bullets because coming through the door they all traveled towards that corner of the uh, um, toilet. So she had to be in a position where head uh, would intersect with the trajectory and from what I could see from the uh, bullet holes, the uh, 4.1 and 4.2, as they are marked on Professor Simon's um, uh, uh, sketch in his report, 4.1, the entry wound is slightly higher than 4.2, the exit wound. So the head could be bent slightly forward, but not a lot, unless it deflected quite wildly inside the skull, but no. that's... You, you cannot exclude that. I mean, I what happened when that. it entered the skull, you cannot predict. But you, you're willing to tell the court that the one is higher than the other, can you? What happens when that bullet entered the skull, you cannot predict. My lady, um, according to Professor Simon, um, entrance wound 4.1 and exit wound 4.2 were connected. My understanding is that he could trace the path of the <coughs> portion of the bullet that went out. So if there was a deflection, the part that deflected, if it was deflected, the exit wounded, it was still in approximately the same direction. Is, okay, apart from the wound on the head, is there anything else that guided you as to the position of the head? Uh, the confined space, my lady, the body is not falling over like that. Um, I don't know what would cause a body to go violently backward against the wall or something and slide down. I interpret it as twisting and in the falling process somewhere until the floor, the head came into the trajectory of the bullet. Now, let us try for the fourth time. Apart from the wound to the head, mm -hmm. is there anything else that guided you as to the position of the head when it was struck? Anything else, sir? Um, <coughs> yes, my lady, as I said yesterday, the, the, th the two obvious contusions in the middle of the back, 4.9, and the area I highlighted above it in that photograph yesterday, combined with mark 4.9, 10, which is the contusion in the medial part of the right buttock, low down, with the lateral extension of that contusion, showed me that the deceased was falling downwards, collapsing, and hit the magazine rack. Now, the magazine rack would then be in front of the wall. So the positioning, she was almost vertical. She struck the, the edge of the magazine rack, which is furthest from the toilet, in front of it, because the, the lateral extension of that contusion is across the buttock that way, and it tapers. If she had hit the other end closest to the toilet, if the magazine rack was in the corner, it would have been going out the other way. If she'd hit the middle of the magazine rack, I wouldn't expect that contusion. This presupposes that 
my interpretation is correct. I based it on that. Uh, in addition, my lady, 4.10 I call, I say it is where she struck because it is low down in the buttock and entry wound 4.5 in the hip caused by bullet A. There was no mention in the reports or the testimony of the forensic pathologist that the bullet had actually deflected downwards substantially because according to my looking at photographs with um, scale bars on and measuring the distance, the lower, the contusion in the buttock was at least 10 or more centimeters lower than the entrance wound on the hip. Oh, yeah, Mr. I, I, I'm, I am going to ask you a question now. Are you saying, standing there, that even after Professor Simon dissected that wound, he's still wrong? My lady, I did not see anything in mm -hmm. Professor mm -hmm. Simon's report that specifically states that the external appearance of the contusion was due to the internal hematoma. He said it was deep-seated. He did not say towards the outside. He dissected the wound. Are you still saying he's wrong? But just that. Are you I'm still not saying he's wrong. Okay, then let us carry on. Just focus on the head. All I ask you is, is there anything else as far as the position of the head when the bullet hit her in the head? Anything else that you took into account? You took into account the wound. You took into account the contusions at the back. You took into account the, wound we, uh, the bruise we're just talking about. What else? Uh, also the lack of visible wood splinters in the head area. Uh, as you recall, my lady, the hip wound and the arm wound on the clothing and in the skin were punctures or pieces of wood which indicates that she was close to the door further away from the door the the forward velocity of the pieces of wood depends on the energy they rapidly drop to the floor I did not in looking at the um, autopsy photos or in any report was there mention of any wood splinters around the head area, and I didn't see them Good. in the photographs. I have that. Anything else? Uh, the other one is the uh, statement by um, Mr. Pretorius that her head was leaning against the toilet bowl. So when she finally came down and w fell forward, she was sitting on the floor, and her head was to on top of the toilet bowl. I don't know the exact position. The other thing that I did mention was that the pool of blood, if she, when she fell to the floor, the pool of blood was towards the toilet side and not more to the toilet side and less to the wall side because the wounds were on the right-hand side. Um, are you saying, no, before we go there, Okay, I have that. Anything else as far as it is concerned? Uh, not that I can recall, my lady. Okay, can you just have a look at this photograph? Does it mean anything to you? Does that photograph mean anything to you? And it's the inside of the toilet lid, my lady, if I'm correct. Yes. What else? And there's hair on it. Uh, what and does it mean anything to you, the hair? Does this photograph 397, my lady? Does it mean anything to you? Yes, my lady. What it says is that the head was in reasonably close proximity to the toilet when it was wounded, if that is the yes. uh, 
material that comes from the head wound and the long black hairs would uh, accord with that. Okay, then we have to just look at your reconstruction. Mm -hmm. A hit and a hip, B hit, a C missed, a, when D hit, a head is already there on your reconstruction. Is already where my at the lady toilet at the toilet lid. Uh, no, my lady, I did not say that. But, but how can you? Why did you not take that into account? The photograph you see there. The head must have been in that. It's hair. It's embedded hair, in tissue. Yes, my lady, that comes from the yes. wound coming from the head. Yeah. That means the head is in the vicinity of the toilet. Doesn't mean it's on the toilet. I never said on the toilet bowl. I said the resting final position when she was on the floor and according to Mr. Pistorius' testimony, your head was slumped there. Now, what we know is when the head went hit her, that she was totally incapacitated, she couldn't move. Do you disagree with that? Uh, my lady, when the bullet hit her head, that would, if she had not yet been totally incapacitated, that would have prevented any further voluntary movement, according to what I have heard and read from the pathologist. It's a killing wound. What? Uh, yeah. However, my lady, if the body is not in a position which, where it is supported, there could be further movement, such as if you're sitting upright, you could fall forward. There can also be volun involuntary movement or spasms. So uh, I cannot exclude after the head is hit that there won't be any further movement. It is possible, my lady. Now, well, I'm putting it to you, sir, that you cannot bring that photograph in line with your reconstruction. Because for, are you saying that while sitting on the floor, a head could have been in, on that height? Are you saying that? My lady, it would be very nice if I was a ballistic expert, and as an expert I can tell you what exactly happened. My reconstruction of the movements of the scene, I do know that when a bullet hits a target, there's material that goes forward and there's material that goes backwards. That material that comes out of, isn't it one line, it spreads. As the wood splinters going through the door can go upright, they can go up, so material ejected as a result of the impact of the bullet on the head, material goes out backwards and would come out forwards. You see, and that can go onto the toilet bowl and the wall at the back. You see, are you, uh, you know, perhaps I have to be fair. You said you're not a ballistic expert, and so I'm just going to test you on two things and then move on. Are you saying that body tissue and embedded hair moves forward out of that wound? We're not talking blood. Blood spatter is something different. I'm talking body tissue and embedded hair moved forward from that wound? Moved away from the trajectory of the bullet as it went in. For, I'm it, asking you a question. Forward. You said forward. Just deal with the forward question. Did it go forward? It went against the travel of the bullet. That could be termed forward, forward. but the okay. angle at which it goes that it, it spreads out, my lady. There's one interesting um, observation you've made. You, so you said, in your experience, if you fire the first shot, the second shot would necessarily uh, lift the firearm? It can, my lady. And you said that's what you took into account, and then you correct it. So you're saying, on your reconstruction, if you look at that, shot was fired, one lifted, but the accused corrected the Far off. My lady, when you... I don't shoot very often. I have done over a number of years. But the first time I pull the trigger and the gun goes off and the gun lifts, I automatically correct and bring it down because I am pointing the gun at a specific uh, uh, target. Then the next bullet that goes off, you 
already know what to expect and you act instinctively. It's not shoot, think, pull down, shoot, think, pull down, correct, aim, and so on. It's, um, okay. And I would think, my lady, if one is a, a trained shotist and does this a lot, you have muscle memory, it is automatic. Now, are you, are you saying that after the wind to the back was sustained on your reconstruction, that the deceased got up again. You're not saying that. Uh, the deceased was lifted up, my lady, by Mr. Pistorius when he took her out of the bathroom. Other than that, I do not believe that she made any more voluntary movements after she, excuse me, fell to the floor. But on your reconstruction, having fallen on the magazine rack, the furthest point of the magazine rack, from the toilet, that's what you said. And that caused the bruise of the buttocks. The contusion, as Professor yeah. Simon says. Good. And in the same movement, it, it for, caused the two contusions, am I correct, on the back? That is correct, my lady. And from that position, she must have then fallen forward towards the toilet bowl. That is my interpretation, my lady. Then one would expect the magazine rack to be there. That is so, my lady. The accused said to this court, definitely wasn't there. Are you now are you giving a, a version that's against the accused's version? My lady, my reconstruction of the events in that toilet are based on the evidence that I can see and measure and that has been recorded by other people. So what you're saying, let me just get that, whatever the accused is saying, you say he's wrong. My lady, I am giving testimony on what I observe and interpret. I am not saying that anybody else is right or wrong. Can, can the accused be right if you're right? He said the magazine rack was definitely not there then he must be wrong. You, he's witness. What are you saying about that? Um, my lady, can I illustrate what I say by reference to a photograph? Now, can you just answer my question, please? He, You'll have an opportunity if Mr. Ru wants to, but... According to me... But I think with respect, my lady, if a witness wants to answer by way of a demonstration or illustration, he's entitled to do it. You can't deprive him of that. He says, I will answer, but can I illustrate my answer? Well, yes, um, I'm not going to argue. I'll allow the witness to illustrate. Yes, because you don't know. He may just be answering yes. your question. Yes, he, he, he may have. Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. My lady, on the um, exhibit PP, photograph 186, mm -hmm. Yes. If that can be put up on the screen, my lady. Um, would you mind just uh, let's have the file back and we can see if we can arrange that. <laughs> my lady, may I just confer with the people behind me? to 186. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll, we're still attempting to get it on the screen, my lady. We were caught on a way.
Uh, there we go. Is that the photograph you would like to refer us to? Uh, that's the photograph, my lady. And you want to respond to my question by pointing out what? Um, my lady, if you have a look at the corner of the toilet bowl, in the blood stain, on the floor, there is a rectangular mark. Uh, maybe it could be enlarged, my lady, and you can see more clearly. Um, just point on, on the screen, would you? I'll point on the screen. It's there. Yeah. That is on the right-hand corner of the front of the toilet. Yeah. Uh, in the blood stain, there is a rectangular um, mark. Yes. <coughs> My lady, the foot of the um, magazine rack, as you can see, is rectangular, approximately that size. Then, if you zoom out again, please, on the photograph, and you look against the wall where the blood stain is running down next to the crack, uh, next to the joint between the tiles, and you have a look at the floor, You can zoom in over there, please. Yes. You will see what I interpret as a blood stain produced by the foot of the magazine rack after it has been lifted up from where it was positioned with its, <coughs> its right back against the wall and the left front against the toilet where the blood pooled around the foot. So what you're saying by showing this to us is that the magazine rack was there. You're convinced. My lady, it could have been there because there is some clotting around the edge. That is my interpretation okay. of where the magazine rack was when the deceased fell and hit her back. And when it was lifted at a later stage, this photograph I think was taken later on that morning, on the, um, it was turned around, that bloody foot underneath was placed on the floor and that is the mark, it's transferred. But, um, so, remember I asked you if you're saying that the accused version is incorrect and, you, and you've now shown us that Indeed, even if you refer to 186, the accused was wrong in his version that the magazine rack was not there. My lady, when the deceased fell, the magazine rack was there. I do not know what happened to it afterwards. But if that it wasn't there when Mr. Pistorius went in, that is his version of the events. From what I interpret from this magazine rack was in that position. I see. No, that's, that's all I wanted to know. Now, let us, let us just move on and deal with something else. I just want to clear something up before I move away from this. You have, in your reconstruction, realized how flat the disease must have been for her to get those two contusions to the back. How low to the ground she must have been and how far back she has to be. My lady, the measurement which... Uh, but let Listen, us not deal with no measurements, can, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll allow you to deal with measurements, but in your reconstruction, remember you, you had somebody there that would go down, that you see that, actually how low that person must be for those injuries to be caused, or did you not? No, it can be caused by that, because it's about 30 centimetres above the bottom of the buttocks. So is that how you worked it out? Yes, my But the then height. the buttocks must be on the floor. The buttocks must be on the floor. Yeah, but the, 
So no, that's you sliding down. Okay. If the person, you have no control. I didn't say the person fell vertically like that. They fell, hit the magazine rack. My lady, the magazine rack has a shape like that. Falling, hitting there, the shock of that, the body, there's no control, can fall in a number, I don't know exactly the direction. Could have fallen backwards and then knocked forwards again into the bowl. It's involuntary, the mass is falling down and hitting against objects. Um, you see, now, now it makes sense to me. If we would just have a look at the photograph and I will <coughs> Let us just have a look at photograph. Well, I'm just looking for the photograph. If the court wasn't in session, I would have found it immediately. No, it's just it's cool. one of those things. Man. Uh, photograph 119 of Exhibit E. Man. If we look at that photograph taken on the scene that uh, morning at nine minutes past six, on your reconstruction, if I understand you correctly, the contusions were formed by the right-hand side of the uh, magazine rack, as we can see it there. Yeah, the right-hand side. Good. I'm going to just put a, a circle. Is that where you pointed out? In this area. I don't know the exact part yeah. because it's... But in that area. area. Yes. And from there, a head must have fallen on the toilet bowl. Yeah. She's coming away from the door, goes down, slides, slumps over the toilet bowl. And the slumping was after the shot hit in the head? I would say so. That was her last uh, movement, yeah. my lady. Okay. There are two things about that. One, I now understand what you're saying. And two, it is... Uh, highly improbable. I would put it stronger than that, but for purposes of this cross-examination, highly improbable that the embedded hair in the tissue would have been caused on the toilet lid if she was where you say she was. It's impossible, sir. What do you say about that? If we look at this photograph, it is impossible. My opinion stays that way, my lady. That's my interpretation. Okay. Now, that's fine. Then, sir, on the 25th of March, you went to the scene of 2014. 25th of March this year, you went to the scene. Yes, my lady. You went on the scene on the 21st of February or the 18th of March? No, my lady. Not that I recall. I, according to my logbook, I went on the 25th of March. We went to Silverwoods, and the following day we went to Kilna Park Shooting Range. Okay. Now, on that particular day, that's when you measured the darkness of the room. No, my lady. On the 25th of March. On the 25th of March, my lady, is when we uh, measured the brightness in the bathroom okay as observed from outside. Yes. Uh, on that particular photograph, I'm going to ask you one question. You've indicated 
that photograph JJJ 2.7. Uh, don't you lady, the photographs that I was given yesterday were not here this morning. They were not replaced. The files were replaced, but not the pile of photographs I was given. And I think I'm the culprit. And I'm handing back the photographs, and the one that I want to refer it to is there. Now, that that is a reflection of what would be visible if the deceased was not on his prosthesis, am I correct? Uh, the accused was not on his prosthesis. Um, what we are seeing here is a person on their knees. Uh, Mr. Pistorius is slightly taller on his stumps because he has an extension below the knee. And yeah, okay. my understanding of his height, his head would be maybe the top of his head might be about 20 centimetres higher than the top of this in person's head. So I don't have to carry on with this cross-examination. What we see on 2.7 is not the reflection of the deceased, the vis how, how visible the accused would have been on his prosthesis, uh, without his prosthesis. Am I right? This is, is, is not Is it. this the, the yeah. picture? No. He would have been higher. There would he have would have been, been a little bit higher. Twenty my lady. centimeters, you said. Approximately, my lady. Yes. Why would you? Why would you not make sure, as an expert, that the court gets the real measurements? Why would you give the court this photograph? My lady, I stated when I did my testimony that this person was on his knees. It is the lowest, and the height of the windowsill is one point approximately 1.1 meters. If person was about, that is just for scale to see when you're outside. The same as the other pictures of the person standing up <coughs> would be approximately, but not exactly the height of Mr. Pistorius, just to see the variation of how high a person is when you are looking from outside. We're talking to an expert, uh, Mr. Dixon. You're giving a court an, an indication of how, how much of the this accused would have been visible on his stumps, if he was on his stumps. Then you give us a photograph that does not reflect that. Why would you hand in that photograph or even take that photograph? My lady, that photograph, we did these tests to look at visibility and light in the toilet compared to the bathroom and we put a person in there for scale purposes and I never stated that that would have been the height that Mr. Pistorius was if he had been on his stumps. I said that person on, on their knees, that is lower. <coughs> then there is another photograph which shows the person standing up so Mr. Pistorius on his stumps would have been <coughs> in between. You see, I am not trying to mislead the court, my I, lady. Yeah, that's what I'm testing. That's what I'm testing. Um, you, you, you mentioned the word misleading. What I don't understand, if that is what you wanted to point out, why would you not ensure that the person on his knees sta stands on something uh, is lifted to scale because you're an expert. Why wouldn't you make sure that his height is exactly the height of Mr. Pistorius on his stumps? Why would you not do that? My lady, it is something I omitted. I overlooked it at the time. You see, I hear you say overlook. I hear you say admit. I'm I was. We're dealing with a expert that's been a policeman that know what he's doing I want to know why you did it. why would you do this I don't understand that my lady as I said it was for demonstration purposes relative heights to see what we could see if a person had been walking hunched 
or if Mr. Pistorius had been walking, standing upright on his stumps, the measurements he is, as I have been informed, when he walks, he is slightly bent forward because of the difficulty with his left leg, the callus, so he leans a bit forward, he would be lower. I don't know exactly what height he would be. His maximum height would be approximately, maybe, if he was on his stumps, around about 20 centimeters higher than the top of the, head, the model on his knees. But now it that would be a lot lower than the person standing fully upright. Now, 20, second, 20 centimeters higher than the person on his knees is a significant variance. <coughs> and I want to know why you would not point out that significant variance up until now. Please indicate to us why. My lady... Um, the questioning and testimony so far has not given me um, the, let's say, the motive, the, uh, uh, the trigger to say that. It's come up now, and I'm mentioning it. It, it, it goes further. You've included it in an uh, album. Now, answer that question and forget the court. Mm -hmm. Why would you include that in an album if you know there's such a significant variance? in what you wanted to show. But just, let's deal with the elk. Because I took the photographs with the model in the various positions, and it does show something. I was looking at visibility. How would people be visible? So it's open window, and behind the window with the door open, door closed, <coughs> various light levels. That I was reporting on that, my lady. Now, you know that <coughs> the Mr. Stipp observed a person moving in that particular window. You know that. Is that what you try to show the court, what Mr. Stipp would have been able to see? Uh, my lady, um, that is what we wanted to see, whether a person would be visible standing in the window. Now, if that is so, if you wanted to point <coughs> out what Mr. Stipp would have been able to see, why did you not ensure that it is the correct height? Why did you not do that? Because we now know what your purpose was. My lady, a scale is a range. This was a scale to give me reference points. The exact height of Mr. Pistorius have indicated, I don't know whether he was standing or walking when he was observed. I don't even know the exact position in the bathroom where he would have been observed. This is for me a scale, topmost height and a height lower down. As I say the windowsill is 1.1 meters. How far were you from, from that window when you took the photograph? I was standing in the road outside the Stipps house at an angle so I could see, um, so I can see past the house that had just been built in the intervening How far period. were you? I know where you, you, you now indicate the court where you were standing. You're an expert, you're giving evidence, you're telling the court what you're putting on record. How far were you? My lady, I do not know the exact distance. Why would meters. you not indicate as an expert I was standing 58 meters from, from the window and I took it and that is what you can see. So My lady, do that? in the report that council is referring to, I, there is a photograph with the position marked with a star. I didn't measure it. I could measure it from the photograph. It does have a scale. Now, you know that the steps did not observe that bathroom window from street level. Uh, that's I'm aware of, my lady. Would that make a difference? Uh, yes, it would make a difference, my lady. Um, I was standing on ground level, and I'm looking up. So a person standing in the window, the angle, they would actually appear higher up than if I'm looking down or horizontally. 
because the higher up you go, the lower the head would be. So in fact, um, this head is higher than it would appear from the balcony no, of the that, steps. That doesn't make sense at all. But I'm not going to argue with you. But that doesn't make sense. Uh, are you saying if you're below a, a target, you see more of the target than when you level with the target? Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is this person is standing next to the window. There is the head. There is the window sill. If I'm standing on the ground, I'm looking upwards, so it appears higher. And if I'm looking from there and I'm looking downwards, it would appear lower, my no, lady. Um, Mr. Stipp, I, don't, ach, I say Mr. Stipp, I apologize. Mr. Dixon, I, I don't agree with you. But let us just move on. So, what time were you there? At, when you took these photographs, what time? Uh, we were there for about three quarters of an hour to an hour, but the photo is around about nine o'clock in the evening, my lady. Nine o'clock in the evening. So you say that the steps, um, curtains were drawn at 9 o'clock in the evening. Is that strange to you? When people are in the bedroom. Is it strange to you? Uh, my lady, I have curtains in my house. Some curtains are always drawn. Some are always open. What different people do is up to them. I wouldn't know. Yeah. That's, that's fine. But it's evening, and if they like their privacy, they draw their curtains. Yes. Um, now, the person we can see on the photograph, who is that? That is Mr. van der Westhuizen. And Mr. Volmerans, who had rolled a deep play on this night? He was observing with me outside. Uh, you and Mr. Vormans were outside, and Mr. Van der is inside. He was inside. And how would you communicate with each other there? By cell phone, my lady. So you would phone him and instruct to him to yeah. switch the light on and off, open the door, Go and various his angles, and those kind of things. Okay. Now on the 14th, you went back there. And that was to test the darkness of the room. That is so, my lady. On the 14th of April, 2013. 2014, Ah, my yes, lady. I'm, I'm wrong. I'm confused. 2014, you're right. Now, what was still in the room? Were you in the, the accused bedroom on the first floor? Yes, my lady. What was still there? There was a bed. There was most of the furniture that had been all the, the houses remained relatively unchanged. So there's the bed, fans, side tables, chest. There was a table with video equipment, a TV screen. There was a sort of wooden bookshelf as you walked in. Okay, so that, that was still there? Yes, my lady. And what, just tell the court what, what you did when you got there and how you did this experiment. Uh, my lady, uh, this wasn't an experiment, this was observation. Uh, to see what we could see at different light levels. As I mentioned earlier in my testimony, this did not replicate the night of the 14th of February when there was no moon at all and there, were, there was less development in the complex, so there were less houses giving light. Um, on the 14th of February, uh, uh, 14th of April 2014, when we did the tests, it was the night before full moon. The sky was very bright. There were a lot more houses around. It was a lot, the light level was much higher. What I did is I looked at the construction of the curtain to confirm that the lining is one of it's a, um, it's a blackout lining. It doesn't let any light in. I've seen it during the day. It, um, it blocks off the bright light. But what I could see was when the curtains were open, there was quite a lot of light in the room. When the curtains were pulled closed, 
It went extremely dark, except for the bottom of the passage leading into the bathroom where there was light coming through the bathroom windows. Let us just deal with the, the first scenario. So with the curtains open, there were quite a lot of light in the room. On the 14th, yes, as I say, it was full moon. Or okay. the night be before full moon. Can I just, so if you say quite a lot of light, you had reasonable visibility. Yes, with the curtains open. Yes. Uh, what would that mean? What, what would that describe reasonable visibility with the curtains open? Quite a lot of light. Describe that to the court. Because you've got nothing else I but... I can see the position of the bed and all of those sort of things. You see... Because if I'm wait, standing... Wait, 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 wait. wait. I, I said you see and I want to ask you a question. And those lot of things... What, why would you answer? I could see the bed and a lot of things. Why would you no. respond like that? As, as, as an expert that went there, as a per seasoned witness, to tell the court, I could see the bed and a lot of things. Why would you respond like that? My lady, the position I was in when I was in the bedroom, when the curtains were open, I was standing at the foot of the bed, between the bed and the uh, electric electrical equipment, the entertainment center, and with the curtains open, light coming in, I can see down to the bathroom. There is the bookshelf on the left-hand side. That gives a nice profile against the light. I can see the bed close to me. That is quite a lot of uh, visibility <coughs> compared to when the curtains are closed and no light is illuminating the bedroom from outside. Now, the, what was the cause of that light? Was it only the moonlight? <coughs> uh, there were a number of houses that had been built in front <coughs> and their lights were on because this was now at 9 o'clock in the evening or 8.30 8 in the evening when people are up and awake. The next door house? Uh, if, you, if you look at the... Um, if you look out in front, there are buildings in front yeah. at various distances. And if, if you're majority. standing in front of Mr. Pistorius' house, the accused house, mm -hmm. and you're facing the house, you're in the street. Yeah, the, yes, you're in the street. Yes. So, I, I'm just trying to explain what, what, what I, which house I'm referring to. If you're standing in the street looking at his house, the house on the left hand side. Uh, on the more to the right. No, no. Okay. You're standing in front of his house, his uh, house left. Yes. Was that, the lights of that house, were they on? Was that on? Is that across the road in no, no, front no, or next right to it? Next to it. When we, um, there were some lights on. I can't recall which ones. Okay. I just looked around and a lot of houses had lights on at that time of the evening, my lady. There were some houses with no lighting on, obviously the people away, and some houses had um, outside lights, but not the, there was no light switched on inside. You but see, I did not make a note of every single house and the state of its... Um, why, why would you not do that? Because that is your purpose. Somebody, the defence team would ask you to go there, come back with a report. You have to explain to the court what you saw there. Why would you not make notes? Why would you not come with a report? Or do you want the court to accept only what Mr. Dixon is saying. My lady, I had been there previously when there was no moon, when we were doing these tests, outside lighting tests, and when the curtains were closed and it was pitch black. We couldn't see anything. We were asked just to go back to do the lighting to confirm and make sure is that actually true. Sometimes it is necessary to do something several times to make sure that um, what you see is a normal state. And as I say, on this night it was a brightly lit night. I not, was not there to observe the brightness outside. 
I was there to observe when the curtains are closed, what can I see inside the room, my lady? Now, you see, that is an interesting observation of yours because you know what the stage case is, that the curtains were open. You did not even take that into account. But you didn't. Um, my lady, I'm, I must say I most probably am not like most of the rest of the world. I do not have a television set. I do not have a radio at my home. After the first few days, I haven't been listening on the radio either. I do not buy newspapers. So I have not been following the case like that. I have my testimony to present and in my experience I don't like to be influenced by external factors. So I do not know all the details of the state's case. I have heard some of it but not all of it. And, and the fact that the, the, the curtains were open, you, you did not hear it. Because that was a question. Did you know that? My lady, I cannot say I did or didn't hear it, but I was unaware of it. Okay. Now, apart from the houses in the surrounding and the almost full moon, were the lights off and the curtains open? What other lights were there? There were the little blue uh, pinpoint lights on the lights uh, um, switches in the bedroom and the bathroom, my lady. And then there was the electronic equipment in the bedroom, which was a um, one of these large entertainment center multi-purpose um, things and there was a CD player above it and there was a TV screen uh, mounted against the wall, a large flat screen, my lady. Um, you remember I asked you for what other light? You there, now refer to the TV screen and things. Okay. With you. The TV has a little red, if you switch the TV set on, on standby it has a red dot in the middle of the lower frame, just a little red dot. The if the CD player is on standby, it's just got a little blue LED that says CD. It's quite dim. And the, the, the big music center, if it's on, it's got a couple of lights um, on the front because it records a number of things. But it's the, the, the LED lighting. There's no big light bulbs or anything else. It's that low level. And the balcony light? The balcony light was off, my lady. Now, you see, the version is that the, of the, even of the accused is that the balcony light was on. Did you not switch the balcony light on? It was very bright outside, my lady. Did you not switch I the balcony light? I did not switch light? the balcony why light. Why not? If, that's the, if you have to try and recreate what the accused could see, why would you not do that? Why would you not do that? My lady, according to what I know, I was unaware that a balcony light was on. However, as I have stated, it was very bright outside, and even with the curtains drawn, you could see the light coming through the cracks, thin line in the middle, and at the bottom. Okay, let's get that. So, in the, the curtains, there were cracks where light would come through at the bottom, at the sides, and in the middle. Um, my lady, the, the balcony has sliding doors. They, slide, open, they are, have got a thick wooden frame about this wide. So the two doors come together, and they have a a sort of like, I would say, looks like a wooden pillar going through the middle. The curtains close against that. The light that I see in the crack was caused by the 
ref light coming through and bouncing from the lining of the curtain outside is a sort of a light colored fabric and that could bounce between the varnished uh, wood and come through the middle. Um, I looked at it, it was not direct light coming all the way through. But that would have been even more if that balcony light was on. It's a possibility, my lady, but as I said, I didn't switch it on. So nobody told you that on the evening that this happened, the balcony light was on? No, my lady. Uh, and you were there with Mr. Borman? I was there with Mr. Borman. He also Bormann. didn't ask you to switch it on? It was not mentioned, my lady. Okay. So, with the lights off and the curtains drawn, closed, you could see the end of the passage. Uh, the end of the passage where it turns into the bathroom, my lady. And did you ask Mr. Vormans to walk down that passage to see if you could see his silhouette? Uh, my lady, anything in the passage? As I said I could see the, the outline of the um, book rack. As you come in the bedroom, and you turn left down the passage to the bathroom, there's this book rack with large wooden shelves sticking out. If you are standing at the curtain end of the bedroom and looking down, you can see that in the backlight from, that is coming in from the bathroom. Uh, Mr. Volmerans went and laid down on the bed. I couldn't see him on the bed. He then got up off the bed and walked towards the passage. I could not see him until he in came in front of the light. It was quite dark, my lady. Now, I think I've asked you, I just have to... Uh, do it again. You, you did not compile a report on this visit on the 14th. Uh, no, I compiled a report uh, when we went on the, on the previous visit, on the light, when we took the photographs. That's what I put in writing. This on the 14th was confirmation. Good. Now, uh, Mr. Dixon, <coughs> as far as the mark on the door is concerned. Where is that portion of the prosthesis that was cut out by Mr. Vormer? That is in my possession, my lady. Do you have it here? I do not have it here, my Why lady. would you come to court, testify about something and it's not here? Why would you not have it here? I did not bring it, my lady. No, I can you fetch it. <laughs> you know, Mr. Dixon, I don't understand it. Why would you not bring it? it? That is the basis of your evidence. Am I right? That the varnish on the <coughs> yes. prosthesis? Yes, on that, that, that portion. My lady, I did not think to bring it this morning. I can fetch it. That was taken after the prosthesis was handed back to Mr. Pistorius. It was cut out then. It was always in defense's possession. Wait. No, no. I thought the leg was the exhibit. Wait, wait. I have photographs. Wait, wait. What are you saying? You're saying it was cut out when? My information is that after the prosthesis were handed back to Mr. Pistorius, it was then examined. Photographs were taken by Mr. van der Westeisen, who removed the piece. It was then given to me. You know, um, we will have to ask Mr. van der Westeisen, but that's wrong. The, 
The piece was cut out before the prosthesis was handed to the police. Can you deny that? I have no idea of the movement of the prosthesis at that stage, my lady. I became involved in the case on the 22nd of February. I received the piece of wood with the, uh, a wood splinter with a varnish on that came from the door from Mr. Wilmerans, and I received the piece of the prosthesis, the sole with the varnish on it, as was shown in the photographs from Mr. van der Westhuizen. Malay, would this be an opportune moment to uh, adjourn for the tea break? Take out tea,